Hello, welcome to EclipseCon 2020. Uh, we're here to talk to you about ubiquitous OSGI, or in other words, run OSGI everywhere. Um, the first thing we'll be talking about is ourselves. Uh, I'm Tom ourselves. Watson from IBM. I'm a senior software engineer uh, in Austin, Texas. Been involved with open source since uh, the early 2000s, uh, starting with the Eclipse project, and then we also started up the Equinox project there. Um, I'm also involved with uh, Apache projects, uh, mainly Ares and the Felix project, and I also uh, do development in Open Liberty. Um, I'm involved with OSGI Alliance doing specification uh, work uh, as well as reference implementations and uh, compliance test implementation. I'm Bart Paltz. Um, I'm a computer scientist working for Adobe um, for, remotely from Berlin. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the Apache Software Foundation, uh, mostly working on Apache Sling and Apache Felix, uh, which are uh, two projects we use in our commercial product, the Adobe Experience Manager, uh, involved with OSGI and uh, Felix for a long time. Um, so in today's talk, um, we actually gonna focus on something which, which I've uh, been working on for, for a long time already. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the, the OSGI is around for a long time. Um, I think we just had our 20th uh, anniversary um, not too long ago and uh, provides, as you probably know, a module layer for, for Java. And it works well um, as long as you're inside um, the OSGI framework. Um, but there typically are two areas where it's a little bit more complicated um, uh, and namely well on the one hand if you embed OSGI in an environment that already makes assumptions about class loaders like traditionally Java AE um, uh, web servers come into into mind um, but also nowadays uh, JPMS for example um, that can be tricky or, or at least it, it needs um, integration work to set things up correctly um, and the other is if you run uh, in Java-like environments, but they are not completely standard, um, like for example, Android, um, but also um, nowadays GraalVM and uh, native images. <laughs> so um, these two areas traditionally cause some problems. And uh, over the years, we had several attempts to, to provide some help in those areas. One was done by me about 10 years ago, um, was called Poetry SR, um, I'm bad with names, um, which was an attempt to just keep the service layer and the lifecycle layer, but but don't do the module layer. And, and Richard Hall um, did something which actually was similar in the end, uh, which was called virtual bundles um, to represent content that's not managed by the framework uh, from the outside as bundles inside the framework. And more recently, when JPMS came along, Tom picked this up maybe, or at least provided his own implementation of something similar um, to make JPMS uh, work better with OSGI. And from that, we came up with the idea of making that as part of the standard um, by effectively um, allowing you to connect content um, from the outside into the framework as bundles. So you represent um, things that are outside of the framework as bundles inside the framework. Um, and we provided API and hooks so that you can do that with, with a standard connector. And uh, we have an implementation of that, um, which we will look at right now in a demo. And uh, Tom is gonna show you how that helps you with, on different platforms. All right, so for this talk, we thought uh, it'd be interesting to start off uh, with demos like Carl was saying, uh, just to give you a taste of the, the actual um, technology, and then we'll go into the specifics of how uh, the technology works. So um, the one thing I wanted to mention first is this is all using the Atomos project and it's using the examples here. So in the Git repository, uh, we have an Atomos examples directory. You can go out and build all of these yourselves and play around with them uh, if you like. So the first thing I was going to start off with was something called uh, JLink. So it's in this Atomos examples JLink. 
Um, so this is all built already. And when you build one of these things, it creates uh, an Atomos uh, directory. This is where the JLink image gets built. For those that aren't familiar with JLink, it's just ba basically part of JPMS. You can take your modules, you run the JLink tool, it'll customize the VM and only give it uh, the modules that are required by your modules. And then it'll create a uh, custom, uh, basically, environment. So this has the uh, Atomos executable in it, and that'll launch up the the modules that you compiled into here, along with the, the ones that are required from the JVM. So if you launch this up, it starts up the Felix GoGo console. Those that are familiar with uh, uh, OSGI are probably familiar with uh, the console. This is a set of bundles that are provided by Felix that gives you access to a console so you can introspect the running framework. And so here I just ran a command that lists the bundles you'll notice. Uh, so the, the system bundle is here just like normal. Here we're running with Equinox, a set of Atomos bundles. But the important thing you'll notice that you wouldn't notice normally is there's these Java modules. So Java base, Java logging, and so on. These are the ones, like I said, that got compiled into the JLink uh, image. And now they're being represented as bundles uh, within the framework. So uh, Atomos comes up and it discovers these modules and then uh, uses the OSGI connect specification to connect them in and provide them here. So you can do in introspection on them. Uh, we can inspect the capability, OSGI wiring package for here we'll do three. Three is Java base. And you'll notice that it's exporting you know, all these packages, you know, Java Lang, Java NIO, so on, the ones that are coming from that Java base uh, module that's always included when you're running on Java 9 or higher. Um, so that's the basics for the JLink. Uh, one thing I wanted to show was um, you can also run a Java command with just the the uh, module path modules. There's a directory in this target that that includes all the modules that got compiled into the JLink image. And then this, the dash M specifies the module you want to run. So this is the module that got run when I ran that Tomos command. And if I run this, it brings up the same thing as you could probably predict, but um, there's many more bundles now. The other one had like 15 or 16. This one has uh, 54. And that's because it's loading up all the modules that are available uh, to the JVM. Here I'm running Java 11. So, so this is basically the list of all those, those modules. Um, so that's all I really want to show you for JLink for now. Um, the next demo uh, is going to be using Graal, but I'm going to be using uh, Jack's RS example. Um, and uh, just real quickly, I was just going to show you this bundle. This uh, is using the Jack's RS um, whiteboard specification from OSGI. Uh, it's using declarative services, so it's specifying a component. And then it's using you know, the standard annotations from uh, Jack's RS for you know, specifying the method for get and the path that it should be bound to and uh, a parameter and so on. Uh, but the interesting thing is it's getting injected const using constructor injection with this thing called a hello service. So this is just another component uh, you know, with it, that can be activated and deactivated by OSGI and it's providing this really simple method that gets called. Um, so when you compile and uh, this build this particular project, it's going to create the native image for Graal, and it puts it under this native image build uh, folder. And then if we can launch that guy, you'll notice it starts up rel pretty quickly, uh, something like 50 milliseconds. Um, and if we, we can have access to the Google console again, uh, you'll notice that we lo lo loading up um, stuff like the Geronimo JAX-RS, the HTTP whiteboard implementation, all the stuff that's required to run, you know, basically a JAX-RS runtime, uh, even an embedded version of Jetty. And all these bundles got compiled down into the Graal native image um, so that we could launch them and run them here. 
Um, so you could, we'll notice that, so if we hit this, you'll notice that yes, it does in fact work and we can give it some other data. Um, and each one of those requests, you know, it goes out to the, that service component and it's creating a new one uh, resource to, to handle that request and then disposing it after the request is done. That's the Grawl one. Um, the final one I wanted to show is a, a class path variant, but um, but we're using the spring loader. Um, so those familiar with Spring Boot may be familiar with the loader. Um, it is what allows for you to um, create these Uber jars that have this boot inf folder, boot inf lib. Uh, and if you're doing a Spring Boot application, you'd have a lot of Spring uh, libraries in here, and then your application code would probably be under boot inf classes. But in this example, I just reusing their, their build infrastructure uh, plugins in order to include a set of bundles. So these are all just bundles that are included in the lib folder. And then the loader uh, creates a, a URL class loader uh, whenever you're loading it up and Atomos can then uh, discover these, these jars and then um, load them up. So if we just do java-jar on that jar, um, we have again all the bundles and we have the Google console again. Uh, you'll notice that we have many more bundles here, 83, and that's because uh, we are running on Java 11. So we loaded up all those bundles from the lib folder, but we are still representing the uh, Java modules that are included in the boot layer. Uh, so they're all still uh, able to be represented within uh, this one single framework instance. Um, this particular uh, jar is running the Felix web console. So if it's just another view that lets you in, interrogate, you know, the running the running framework. Um, so that is the end of the demos. Let me get back to the. All right. Now I'm going to go into the uh, Apache Felix. Uh, Tomos project and give a, a little bit more details on that since we went through the um, the demos. So it's uh, hosted at the Apache Foundation within the Felix project. There's the GitHub repository, like I mentioned before. This contains the all the implementation, the tests, and uh, those examples that I was just uh, going through in the demos. Um, so the idea behind Atomos is that we want to enable these uh, other layers uh, above the module layer. So OSGI is more than just a module layer. Uh, the, the OSGI module layer is quite powerful, provides for isolation, you know, similar to JPMS. I, I would say it's sort of a, a slight uh, superset of what JPMS provides, but that's just the module layer itself. There's also the lifecycle layer, which provides, you know, the entry points into code so that you can activate your individual bundles and make them uh, start participating within uh, the framework. And then you can also stop them so they can disable them from, from uh, their components from actually doing anything. Uh, and, and then the actual programming model that we encourage uh, developers to use is a service layer. And this is provides the common uh, collaboration space where different uh, things can, can share, the bundles can share, you know, components with each other, they can publish services and so on and so forth. Um, but the, it's a common place where you can do things like use declarative services, which can provide uh, services, but then also integrate with CDI components, and those can also provide services, and they all can share through this common layer. And here, we just want to be able to swap out that OSGI module layer so that we can continue to use those, uh, the, the, what I view as kind of the more powerful model of OSGI and where the, the pro real programming model lies. So when you're using JPMS, uh, it you know creates this thing called a layer, and the layer controls the class loader, and it controls access to all of the modules, and that's how they're providing their isolation between modules and be able to do all that within like a single class loader uh, by default. 
And when you're running with Atomos, we are able to interrogate that layer and discover all the modules and then look at the, all the individual modules, figure out which ones are bundles, they have bundle metadata, and which ones don't, and then those ones we can generate OSGI metadata and then represent them as bundles uh, connected in the framework. So that's how in the demos, it, Atomos was showing those JRE boot model modules represented as bundles. Um, Atomos also supports what we call the flat class path. That was like the, the Spring Boot example I showed you, but you could also just do like a dash CP from the Java command line and list all your bundles there. And um, as long as uh, we have a class to work with that returns uh, jar URLs uh, for resources, we're able to discover all the bundle manifests and then associate those uh, uh, jars with bundles and, and then get those connected in, but still uh, use the, that single class loader that's getting used. And like I mentioned in the demos, when we're running on Java 9 or higher, we also still continue to represent those um, modules that are loaded up from the VM in the boot layer as bundles uh, inside the framework. Obviously in this uh, model, there's no isolation for those classes uh, classes on the class path between the different jars, uh, unlike when you're running with uh, JPMS or, uh, you know, OSGI class loaders. Uh, we also support uh, native here. Uh, I'm referencing a uh, Grawl substrate native. Um, there's no real class loading here. This the classes just are part of the uh, compiled code when you when you compile a uh, image and, and substrate. Um, but there is challenges because OSGI, like its declare services model or even its uh, bundle activation, it needs to be able to reflect on classes, be able to create uh, new instances of them and reflect on methods in order to inject stuff and, and so on. So um, Atomos provides some build tools in order to configure that um, reflective stuff for uh, substrate. Uh, the other challenge is being able to take, uh, when you compile resources into an image, it puts it all in one flat space. So Atomos provides an in indexing strategy so that you can uh, di differentiate one resource that belongs to a certain bundle from another resource. And that's important for things like declare services where we need to find this XML and associate with a bundle so that that XML that's providing the component definitions those components can get associated with a particular bundle. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention a Android application. A uh, Atomos can also work there. It's similar in Grawl uh, in the sense that it, it all your resources, again, kind of just get put into one executable. So we need to do that indexing. Um, but I will say either there's no uh, reflective uh, uh, configuration needed there. So it, it does end up being a little bit easier than than substrate in that sense. Right. And with that, uh, we come back to um, what actually makes this possible. So the, um, the nice thing about Atomos is that it uses uh, um, a new specification part of OSGI. It's part of the OSGI core R8 release, which right now is uh, in proposed draft state. Um, so hopefully it's available soon, um, but it's part of the core um, and, and it really is nice because it actually didn't change that much in the framework API to make all of this possible. So um, when we look at the framework API, um, all that really happens is, and that's how you can control it, um, that typically um, when we, we call install bundle, right, to install a bundle. So we give it two pieces of information, um, a location, uh, which is first and foremost, just a unique um, uh, uh, string that identifies a bundle, uh, which may or may not be in form of a URL. Typically you assume it's a URL, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And uh, optionally, you can also give it a stream um, from which to read the content for, of the bundle from, right? So when you call that method um, uh, on the framework, um, it will uh, first see if you gave it a content stream. If so, well, yeah, okay, then it, then it sucks down that content and, and persists it um, in its storage. Um, 
Otherwise, um, if it uh, if, if you didn't give it a stream or uh, if, if that doesn't work, it will look at the location and see if it can determine what to do with it. Or well, typically that means we, we look at the location and, and see if it's a URL. And if so, we try to read from that URL, right? So um, in either case, we assume that what we can read is a JAR file, um, at least for the most part. Um, uh, sometimes there's a special case for the local file system, but typically it should be a JAR file. And then we persist that in the bundle cache, and, or in other words, in the local storage. Um, we read the manifest from it uh, uh, and, and create a bundle object for it that represents it inside the framework um, and put it into an installed state. Um, later on, when it's getting used, it will be moved to resolved. Um, resolved for all terms and purposes means that wirings are completed, so we know, we should be sure it can start up and we create a class loader for it. So, and then um, when content is requested from the bundle, we ask that class to load from the bundle, with load, which loads it from the jar on the, in the storage. So now, um, what we did with OSGI Connect um, is we effectively allow some hooks or an SPI um, to be injected into that process. So how that works is um, that, uh, so you have typically the framework, which you pick up someplace and it implements the framework factory. And um, we introduce some new factory, which is a connect framework factory, which actually extends framework factory. And that's a new method, which in addition to the normal configuration takes a module connector. So the module connector is the other piece of the puzzle that makes OSGI connect work. Um, and in our case, just to think back of it, Atomus is in this case a module connector, right? So the launcher will take a framework and a module connector and create a new framework instance together um, from the connect framework factory. And then you get a normal running OSGI framework. So uh, everything works like normal. However, um, when you now do an install bundle, um, into that running framework, um, again, with the location, um, uh, it will, it will see for that location um, whether the connect, uh, whether the module connector um, knows about it, right? So it's, go it's going to tell him, hey, I get a request to install um, this location, in this case, bundle A, and the module connector can answer with, okay, yeah, I, I take that one over, or it can say, no, I don't. Um, so in this case, let's assume it does, right? Because for example, Atomos is the module connector and it, and it, and, and it knows there's a JPMS module um, called like that on the module pass. Well, then it gives us back um, a connect module and the framework will use that connect modu module instead of what it previously had uh, in its local storage to load um, uh, uh, content from and represent it as a bundle. Uh, we get the manifest from the connect module, we get the content from the connect module and represent it as a normal bundle, but actually it's coming from the outside. And then later on, when it's going to be, we, we move to resolve state and all the wiring stuff typically still happens. Um, we also ask for a class loader from the connect module. So in, in assuming it has one, um, uh, we start using that class loader instead of the one that we typically would create ourselves inside the framework. So, and that, Pretty much is it from the spec pers perspective. There's a little bit of extra um, things here and there that, that, that need to be done to, to make the magic happen. But uh, the core really is just that. So for you as a user from a um, management agent point of view, actually nothing changes. Uh, you can still work with opaque uh, uh, string locations. And uh, from the implementation perspective, all you need is a module connector that does what you want and recognize what you want. So we have Atomos now in Felix, um, which sort of is, a, you know, it's not the standard, but, but it's, it's, it's hopefully something that, that will cater to most situations. Again, it supports uh, JPMS, it supports flat class parts, it supports Android, um, and it supports native images right now, right? But it's also the module connector itself is a very thin interface uh, as well. So um, we had cases where people were able to, you know, implement something themselves um, within not too much time. So if you have a special case, you can implement it with a module connector yourself. But if you have a standard case, yeah, you probably um, can take Atomos directly um, to make it work. And it all blends in very well with, with the normal framework operations. And again, if the module connector doesn't recognize the URL or location that it gets, well, then the normal stuff happens, right? So it's still possible to install a bundle in, into this running framework just like normal and it will interact with the rest of the bundles.
So it really gives you um, a nice blend of the two worlds and just allows you to connect um, some stuff from the outside into the framework. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we wanted to show today. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. And we're gonna yeah we're gonna stay around for a little longer to answer questions if you have any. And um, yeah, uh, don't forget to vote. All right. Thank you. Okay. I guess we're back into question mode. Um, we got we got a couple of questions. Um, let me let me quickly answer uh, one, um, which is uh, uh, when will this be uh, released or available? Um, uh, so we for Atomos and Felix, we right now we're kind of waiting for the OSGI core um, spec to be finally released. Again, it's in, in final draft form right now, but um, the, the voting is happening. Um, so I guess uh, towards the end of the year, we hopefully have then both um, OSGI Connect uh, in the form of R8 uh, and uh, a release of Atomos. So that's the goal at least. Yeah. Um, another one of the questions was, can OSGI Connect finally put an end to rebundling non-OSGI libraries? Um, the answer is yes, but uh, you, you need to, like Carl was showing, have the installer just use the opaque URLs and then uh, you can't use input streams because when you use input streams, we assume no connector. Uh, but then you'd have to have a connector that uh, can go and interrogate the actual you know, jar that's being installed and provide that up to the framework and then you know, obviously figure out what metadata is needed for that you know, by using something like the BND libraries or something like that to produce the bundle manifest. Uh, another question is after OSGI uh, 8 is released, will Connect be part of Equinox? The answer is, well, it is already part of Equinox. Um, the demos I did are, are were on Equinox itself. It, they also work on the Felix branch uh, for Connect, but we did release with the last uh, release of Eclipse Equinox that implements the R8 in its uh, current uh, final draft form. Um, so it, it's already ready to go uh, if you want to play around with with that implementation uh, with your own module connector or with uh, Atomos. Um, I thought there was some other questions. Um, well, I, I guess question. we have in the Atomos project, if you look, we have, we have both uh, uh, already pre-built, right? We have a Felix version. Yeah, and it, an it does version. both a Felix and um, and Equinox. It seems that we're at the end of the session. The other question was compiling Eclipse to native. Uh, possibly, I haven't done it, but uh, I, I know SWT, I thought I saw somebody be able to compile a small SWT apps down, uh, but the um, the the all the rest of the stuff there's a lot of bundles there that it would it would be uh, quite a bit of work to do it but thanks for everybody for joining yes I think we probably Thank are you. cut off by now <laughs> bye bye